Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for tonight's CRO Career Conversation. My name is Laura Raleigh and I serve as Director of Life Science Economic Development at the North Carolina Biotechnology Center and co-lead our North Carolina CRO Collaborative with my colleague Vivian Doling. And while North Carolina is undoubtedly a leader in clinical research, career opportunities in the field remain elusive to many. And through this event series, we'll be inviting professionals from the CRO industry and research sites to speak candidly about their own experiences and provide a bit more information about the many rewarding career opportunities that exist. We recommend using Zoom's gallery view during tonight's conversation to allow you to see all of our speakers. And while attendees are muted to avoid potential disruptions, we do encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A function. You'll also see a function to upvote questions. So if you see someone else submit a question that you're also curious about, please give it a thumbs up. We will be devoting the last 30 minutes of tonight's session to answer your questions, and I'll be prioritizing those with the most likes. So without further delay, I will turn it over to our moderator, Susan Pusick, to introduce herself and kick off tonight's discussion all about clinical research coordinators, also known as CRCs. Susan, take it away. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everybody. We are so excited to be here with you tonight. We're glad you all took some time to learn a little bit more about this um, really critical potential career pathway. So my name is Susan Pusek, and I am now at the North Carolina Translational and Clinical Sciences Institute, which is essentially a big institute that focuses on trying to make research easier for researchers and for patients. So, um, but before that, I actually was a research coordinator myself for 15 years. So I am again, very excited to be with you tonight. To orient us, so you, you all understand some of the terminology our panelists will be using. I wanted to walk you through this very, very simple slide that talks about really the, the major players in the clinical research process. And these are some of the terms that you'll be hearing our panelists refer to. So on the left, you, you know, are the sponsors. And when we talk about sponsors, generally we're talking about the people who are funding the research, the people who have a product to be tested, who have written the protocol, who have produced the, the data collection tools. So often that's a pharmaceutical company like a Pfizer, a Moderna, a Johnson & Johnson, um, but it could also be the National Institutes of Health or a foundation and every once in a while, a uh, site investigator is also a sponsor. Sponsors need places to conduct their research, so they will reach out to research sites. And so one of the interactions we'll talk about is the interactions between sponsors and research sites. Sponsors can also choose to have a middle person, a middleman, between themselves and a research site. And when we talk about CROs, that's what we're talking about there. So CROs might be something like Covan or IQBIA. And in that case, the CRO is interacting with the research site as well as having interactions with the sponsor. Now, research sites are what we're gonna talk a lot about today. But you should know that research sites are all very different. And so we're fortunate tonight that we have people representing a couple of different models of research sites. So I've just listed here a number of the different roles that you'll often see that have to contribute to a clinical research study. And at some sites, you have separate people doing all of these roles. Whereas at other sites, the research coordinator does all of the roles, okay? So the two things I really want you to remember are that when we talk about um, who is who in the clinical research world, clinical research associates or CRAs work for the sponsor or the contract research organization. Whereas the clinical research coordinators work for the research site. And the second thing I want you to remember is that clinical research coordinators interface with our research volunteers, either patients or normal volunteers, okay? And that really is a big difference because if you are a CRA, 
you can't be exposed to the research volunteers and participants. It's actually a violation of confidentiality and a conflict, okay? So with that, let's go ahead and launch into our conversation. So welcome panelists, thank you for being here. I'd like to start with um, introductions. If you can just introduce yourself, your name and your organization and wh where you are in North Carolina, the site you're based at. So we'll start with Catherine. Hi everybody, my name is Catherine Barnes and I am based in Chapel Hill, North Carolina because I work at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Thank you so much for having me this evening. Thank you, Kendra. Hey there, I'm Kendra Marr. I work for Wake Med in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, Wake Med Hospital. Thank you, and KP. Hi, my name is Katherine Peterson, KP for short, since there's two Catherines in this call. Um, I'm from Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. And Sherry. Hi, everyone. I'm Sherry Huber, and I work for Duke School of Medicine. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, so our first question, we're gonna start with Kendra. Kendra, can you tell us how you discovered the clinical research field? Well, back in my undergrad at NC State, um, I actually did some laboratory research uh, with mouse intestinal cells. So that was kind of my introduction to what research is, but on the laboratory side. Then I went into clinical site and I worked as a nurse aide and a surgical technician in labor and delivery with Wake Med and realized I wanted to combine the two. I wanted to help patients and I still wanted to be research. So I started pursuing my, my career goal as a researcher. So that's how I got to that part. Thank you. Um, KP, do you want to tell us how you learned about clinical research? Of course. Um, so I graduated from Furman a few years back. And while I was there, I tried to make a concerted effort to try and um, navigate the different fields within public health, which was my major at the time. And I did an internship down at Emory where I was a data analysis, but I was able to shadow one of the surgeons and their clinical research coordinators. And I really loved the work, being able to interact with the patients. And that was how I found clinical research work. Fabulous. Sherry, can you tell us how you got into clinical research? Um, hi, I have only been doing it for a little over a year, but I research the what do research coordinators do. Um, I use Google, I use YouTube because I knew I was moving to the Raleigh-Durham area and I knew biotech was really big here. And I thought I've done lots of other nursing things in my other jobs. And I thought research would be something new and I don't have to go back to school to do it, but I feel like I'm getting a master's degree because I'm learning something new every day. Thank you, and Catherine. I actually kind of fell into the field on accident, like you'll see so many people say to you probably. Um, and so I was actually attending one of my colleagues' honors thesis presentations at the end of my undergraduate degree. And their honors thesis um, advisor was a PI or a principal investigator, the doctor who kind of runs the trial. And she had told me they were doing a large data collection push and were hiring a lot of research assistants um, for the next six to eight months and asked me if I was interested in applying, and I applied, and it's, the rest is history. Well, there you go. All right, thank you. Now we get into the really good stuff, okay? So I would like you to tell the group how you got your first job as a CRC. So Catherine, I think you've answered that question for us. Thank you. So let's go ahead and Sherry, can you start? Sure. Um, I, I was visiting this area and I met a few people who worked in research. They were physicians, some coordinators, and I just started asking them questions. Um, how do I get into this field? And um, then I met someone who worked at Duke in the School of Medicine. And I said, you know, I'm really interested in this field. I don't know if I have the qualifications, but I, I learn really quickly. I love to learn new things. And if you could 
just point me in the right direction where to send my resume. And she sent it on to someone and I had a phone interview and then got an interview. And at first it was a little scary, but I, I really love it. The best job of my career, I'll have to say. And were you looking for a specific area of research or just any research job? I really, I was interested in really any area, but I knew I, I didn't want to do anything like the ICU. I don't have any ICU experience. So my first job was dermatology. I thought, well, I should be able to handle that. <laughs> um, but yes, I love it. It's been a great job. And your background, tell us your educational background. You're a nurse. Yes, I'm a nurse. I have a um, bachelor's from the University of South Carolina. And I've been a nurse for about 25 years. I've worked in the emergency department, um, home health, public health. Um, I'm probably forgetting something, <laughs> but lots of different, but never research. I hadn't done it, but it sounded so interesting to me. So I took hey, the dive. Thank you. Kendra, can you tell us your story? Sure, I'll try. <laughs> So uh, I'll just start with my education. I went to North Carolina State University and got a dual degree, one in nutrition science and one in food science. I actually had inspired to be an OBGYN way back in the day. And then when I started going to school, I was like, nope, not doing that. <laughs> so I uh, finished my degree, started working in the clinical environment with Wake Med, and then wanted to go into research. So I actually applied to Duke at that time. And again, I was just searching for anything just to get in there. Worked in orthopedics, and then I actually moved into a variety of different uh, specializations. And then now I'm at Wake Med and pediatrics, because that's where I've always wanted to be. And so is your first research position was in orthopedics? That's correct. Okay, okay. And you didn't have any prior experience there? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, KP. So much like Kendra, I also started my career in orthopedics. I was working as a um, clinical research associate. So one of the titles that we mentioned earlier, that was my gateway into clinical research coordinator role. Um, I just started working there. I loved it, but I felt like, especially with COVID, when we were told to work from home for over a year now, I felt like I was ready to make the next step so I could get back into the hospital and start interacting with people again, which is the environment where I thrive. So I went on the Atrium job posting board and I found my current position because I love Atrium and I wanted to stay. Thank you. Catherine, can you um, tell the audience your opinion on whether someone who is, um, obviously we hear this story that all of you guys were essentially kind of new to the field, okay? So what kinds of things would you advise the audience if this is, they're applying as their first job? Um, things that maybe they should put on their resume, skills that they might highlight, if you all could kind of give us some ideas about that. Sure. So um, when I review people's resumes and CVs, as sometimes they're called, um, I really try to tell people to look at all of your past experiences. I like to say that any experience that you have in your life, good or bad, professional or even personal, you have the choice to learn something from it. And I see a lot of resumes and CVs that, you know, they say, okay, I worked, for instance, I worked in an ice cream shop um, in high school, and that was my main job before I got into research. And so I see people have things that say, oh, okay, I worked in an ice cream shop. Well, that could teach you customer service skills. It teaches you responsibility. It teaches you communication skills as well. And so really kind of think about what did I learn from this experience and how can I apply it here? Um, I would also say too that you know, communication and writing skills are very, very important in research. Um, a lot of people think, you know, there's a big barricade that you have to have a degree in the sciences. You have to, you know, know all of this stuff about medical terminology. And while that is a plus, I see people in the field that have um, bachelor's degrees in public policy, in communications, in other um, fields as well. I have a degree in bio and anthropology myself. And so, again, that communication and writing is something that's very important. Terrific. Kendra, anything you want to add? Uh, I would agree with Catherine. The one thing I would, would say, having time management skills and um, attention to detail, those are really big for clinical research. KP, anything? 
I would shadow and mirror exactly what Kendra and Catherine said. Um, if you are really interested in going into the clinical research role, I would definitely recommend finding someone on LinkedIn that has this role already and have some sort of informational interview with them, ask all the questions that you want to ask, and even ask if you can shadow them for a day, especially once COVID's come and gone, it's going to be a lot easier to get back in the hospital and allow people to shadow or be an intern or something like that. So that, that's a great point, actually. So um, is it um, correct that at Atrium, you would be able to shadow potentially? I would have to get approval and definitely not now, but in a post-COVID world or one where everything's a little bit calmer, I think we could definitely make that happen. Getting an internship at Atrium is a little bit harder just because you have to, we either have to pay you or you have to get course credit from us. And sometimes it's a lot easier to get the course credit aspect than the payment aspect. So, but shadowing can definitely be done. Okay. Um, and Kendra, do you want to add something? I was just going to say um, with same, similar to Catherine, uh, WakeMed actually offers an internship program. So if anyone's interested, they can kind of reach out to us and we can help them with that. Okay. Sherry, do you have anything to add in terms of skills that people should amplify on their resume? Did you think about anything in particular you wanted to bring out when you were applying? Well, I will have to agree with, I think it was Kendra brought up, you have to be very organized. Um, and like she said, detail oriented, but yes, you also have to see the big picture. Um, and then I also wanted to add that I'm sure UNC has the same thing Duke has. We use students for a lot of our research projects. And I think that is a great way for them to get a foot in the door to see, do they like clinical research? Okay, thank you. All right, so let's move on to your average day which we laugh about because I think you'll realize that there really isn't an average day as a research coordinator. Um, but KP, do you wanna start off and tell us what your average day might be like? Sure, um, depending on your average day, average week, it really depends on where all of your clinical trials are standing at the moment. Currently, we have a good number of sponsor studies open and a couple of internal studies. So I'm working with the IRB a lot, negotiating, making sure that our protocols are up to date and that our surgeons and fellows are keeping up with the protocols and following all the procedures. Some days I'm in the OR um, helping and assisting with uh, clinical device studies that we are doing that patients consent for. Or like right now I'm waiting for a text to see if I'm gonna be in the OR tomorrow or not. So you really don't know what your day is gonna look like probably until day of, unless you strategically map out your day. But I really love that about the position because you're able to just be flexible. You're not, you don't know what you're always going to be doing. And it's just a lot of fun. I love it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Catherine, do you want to tell us about your average day? Sure. So I'd like to preface it by saying that I work in a very interesting unit here at UNC. We're called the Research Coordination and Management Unit. And so we actually serve any principal investigator or again, doctor leading the study across the entire university. A lot of research jobs that you'll find are in one type of department. So orthopedics, GI, hematology, things like that. But the written is a little bit um, uh, different in that way because we serve everyone. So that being said, the average day of a coordinator in the RICMU can vary very, very widely. So we do everything from regulatory submissions, so things like IRB submissions, which is our institutional review board. We see patients in our clinics. Sometimes those are located inside our hospital. Sometimes they're located in our clinical and translational research center, which is our research clinic. We also do things um, like hiring, mentoring, and onboarding personnel. That's a lot of what I did um, in the RICMU. And I also do monitoring. So that is what we would like to call like a CRA type position, only I'm not officially a CRA. I do internal monitoring for the university. So like you'll probably hear us all say it varies widely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sherry. Um, I also work in a department that's similar to where Catherine works. I work for the Office of Clinical Research. So they um, allocate my position 50% dermatology, 50% I work at a research facility. And a typical day can be I may be calling potential um, research participants to tell them about a study. 
that the principal investigator thinks they're in their clinic. They may be, they know that I'm going to be approaching them. So that's called recruitment. And that's very interesting part of the job. Um, or I may have um, a research subject coming in for a, a new study. So I'm going to be consenting them which takes a bit of practice because we want to make sure that they understand that what they are signing up to do, it's voluntary. Um, or I may be part of the unblinded team, which means I'm giving the study medication. So I have, I work with a team, there's blinded people and I'm the unblinded um, pharmacist giving them medication. So that's just some of what I do. Kendra, your turn. <laughs> so these ladies have captured pretty much everything, but I'll try to throw in a couple extra things. So um, what we also do is we do have to coordinate with physicians and um, try to keep them on track, but also update them with our patients and the visits we've had. And then we also have to do a lot of drug management. This is a big thing. Um, making sure our drug is, is, uh, up to date, not expired, making sure we have enough, making sure they're not expired when our patients have the drug at home. And then we do a lot of data entry as well. So everything we see with a patient, we have to somewhere at some way inform and usually w doubling it. We have to document it, paper form, usually electronic as well. So a lot of our day is spent with that when we do see a patient. Other than that, when we're not seeing a patient, a lot of times we're communicating with the sponsors and kind of updating them with what's maybe to come, trying to close down a study, um, organizing, getting rid of old things, getting new things started, binder organization. There's so much to go around, but these ladies did a good job at touching base with everything that we do. Terrific. Um, so I wanna know a little bit more, maybe a little bit more detail in terms of, um, how you communicate with your team. I think Catherine, you had kind of introduced this idea that you work as part of a team. Um, is a lot of your interaction more email? Is it phone? Obviously, I know we're virtual now, but without COVID, you know, did you spend a lot of time on the phone? Were you in the clinics recruiting subjects? I mean, how did your interaction go um, with other people? Yeah, so it's really a mixed bag, like you were alluding to, Susan. Um, there's a lot of emails, um, as you probably can guess, because in research, if it wasn't documented, it didn't happen. So we always need written documentation and things like that about the conversations we have, especially regarding research participants and potentially their safety events during the trial. However, with participants, pre-COVID, of course, we were in person in the clinics, interacting with them that way, which is always lovely, especially with longer trials. You really get to know them as people. Um, um, and just talk to them about their daily lives, too, as well as giving them um, potentially life-saving medication that they need. Um, also, with our team specifically, we all shared an office back before COVID hit. And we were a little bit cramped, but it's kind of it was so much fun because we would all talk to each other, bounce questions off of each other in person, um, and really be there for each other. And we have a really great sense of camaraderie in the Rick Mill. Thank you. KP? Anything you want to add about communication? So I've been fortunate enough that I go into the office two or three days a week nowadays, um, just because mask regulations are in place and we have been vaccinated, which is amazing. But I sit in an office with our clinical research associate and we communicate all day long about the various studies and what I need his help with. And our research manager, who's both of our bosses, is in the office next door and she has an open door policy. So we're there all the time with her. When I can, I will try and meet patients in clinic to consent them for potential studies that they may or may not be eligible for. Um, and then I'll also phone call them if I miss them. And I'll even, once patients get home and discharged after one of our studies, I'll just follow up with them, see how they're doing, see if there's anything that I can do to make their experience a little bit better. And Sherry, do you have anything to add here? Um, I would say just a little bit, I would say my experience is like KPs. I go to the office five days a week, but we also use Teams to communicate, Zoom meetings and WebEx and lots of emails. Mm -hmm. Kendra, similar for you? Yes, it is. And we are also in the office five days a week. Um, we're actually starting a, a remote kind of position so we can kind of go back and forth 
I will say my position is a little bit different than the other ladies. I actually work with a team, but I'm by myself with pediatrics and I also bounce to other different sites as well. So I kind of go all around Raleigh, Cary, Apex, Garner area. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this question um, is also about communication, but um, Sherry, you know, you're a nurse, you've been in the medical field for a while and are kind of used to that medical environment. So for the other three panelists, um, I'm curious if you can kind of give the audience a little bit of a feel about, you know, how you started learning how to give direction essentially to doctors and to fellows and all the other people who had to actually carry out the study procedures. So Kendra, do you have any thoughts on that? So it's a delicate conversation. I will say that. <laughs> um, you definitely want to make sure that your physician is leading the study. It is their study. Um, and you kind of are just guiding them through the procedures, letting them know what does IRB policy say and then what the actual research study says. Um, there are a lot of physicians out there now that are research engaged and they totally understand research, which makes our lives so much easier. Catherine, anything to add? Yeah, I would just echo what Kendra said. Again, just going back to documentation, documentation, documentation. Um, bring with you the patient chart to show them like this is what's going on. Bring the protocol with you. And usually they're very um, happy to help. KP, anything? Um, just I found it very beneficial and helpful to have um, some personal connections between me and the attendings and the fellows, making sure they know something personal about me, I know something personal about them so we can communicate that way. So it's not always just business conversations, business conversations. And also just having everyone's phone number makes everything a lot easier. If you need a quick yes, no, maybe so. And don't be afraid to say no. It's also a big thing. Don't be afraid, tell, don't be afraid to tell the attendings and the surgeons no, you can't do this. So are you specifically, when you talk about that, are you referring to, you know, maybe situations where they think they have a potential subject and you check the inclusion criteria and they're not quite eligible and you have to say Correct. no. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, when we're suggesting new studies and we don't have the bandwidth for it, I am also the no person mm -hmm. for that. Ah, I see. Sherry, is that kind of consistent with your experience? Yes, I agree. I would just reiterate what KP said that don't be afraid to say no because the PIs are looking to their coordinators to really have a good understanding of that protocol. We, we're not the physician, but we really know what that protocol and what our IRB says. So they do look to us for some guidance. So one thing um, I want to follow up on that you all, I think, had had captured. So in Sherry, in your model, you are a nurse and you described this situation where you actually were administering a study drug. Do you also, you must have teammates who are non-nurses, right? And you all work together and just divide out what makes sense, right? Absolutely. Okay. And um KP, are you, do you also interface with nurses, research nurses, or are you the primary coordinator? I am the primary coordinator for our department. There is a clinical research nurse in the Department of Surgery as a general, but we oversee very different studies and we just communicate when we have questions that we know the other person might have the answer for. And so, so far that has not been an issue for you. You've been able to conduct everything you need to do for the study without being a nurse. Okay. Um, Catherine, similar for you? Yes. Yes. And we also at UNC have an investigational drug um, pharmacy mm -hmm. here. And so those are the people that actually dispense our drugs and fill it for us if we do have drug studies. Perfect. And Kendra, is similar for you. You said you're kind of by yourself, but um, if there were studies that maybe needed more intense clinical stuff, um, would that be the situation? Yes, so we've had those, those um, studies that do have more intense things like PK sampling. And I've actually been trained to do dr blood draws. So I do all the blood draws for our patients. I dispense medication, the study drug. Um, I can't do IVs. So that's when that comes into play. We usually will try to get um, a nurse that is available who would be willing to help us. And we'll put them on the study and kind of work that out. 
Terrific, terrific. So I think, you know, that's an important thing for our audience to kind of appreciate is that it sounds like, you know, in these research environments, once they bring you in, there is the opportunity to be trained to do things you're allowed to do, but it is also a highly regulated environment. So there may be things that you're not licensed to do, whereas, you know, a nurse may be the more appropriate choice. Um, so when they hire you or when you're interviewing, it might be a good idea to kind of ask them, you know, who is the team? What types of studies do they do? Um, the other thing I just want to, you guys, panelists can give me a thumbs up, but it sounds like there's a little bit of an element of lack of control in your schedule. And not necessarily a bad thing, but the dynamic is that, you know, you try and schedule what you can in terms of paperwork and IRB, but the reality is you're there to enroll subjects, right? And is that true for everybody? So there's a little bit of up and down. Um, and so that's also something to consider in terms of looking for a CRC position. So let's move on to the next question, which is, what do you find most challenging about your role as a CRC? So Catherine, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, I think probably one of the most challenging things is just keeping all the balls up in the air. Um, I find myself very lucky to be in this position because there are so many different things I get to do. But as um, a CRC, I also am a project manager sometimes as well for studies. And so I do study startup. I help, um, there's these big grants called R01s that the National Institutes of Health give out. And so I'm writing protocols for those. I'm writing case report forms, databases, things like that. So there's that type of work. And then there's also seeing study subjects. And that can be sometimes a little bit hard to juggle because you've got a patient visit at 7.30 that will last till one, but then you have a meeting at two and you're trying to figure all of that out. Um, and usually as a coordinator, at least at UNC, you're juggling about four to seven studies, I would say at one time. I wouldn't necessarily say that's something that puts you over a 40 hour work week because all of the studies have a little bit different effort, but there are different studies that you have to work with. So you really have to be, like Kendra was saying, organized and detail oriented to make sure you can keep all the balls up in the air. Okay, KP. How about for you? What's the most challenging? And if you could also speak to about how many studies you're working on and whether you know your work is really able to be a 40 hour week or do you need to be flexible? Definitely. So I just have about three sponsor studies. So studies that we are paid to do at our site. And then we have about three or four internal sites of studies that we're working on right now. I'm definitely able to make my week a 40 hour work week with all of that going on. But I will say I do sometimes have to work on the weekends if we have a case that I have to be there for it. But I will, my boss will tell me to take a Monday off, take a Tuesday off to make up for it. And also sometimes you get SAE, serious adverse events reported over the weekend and those have to be documented within about 24 hours. So sometimes you have to hop on real quick and do something. But um, I would say that's not the most difficult thing for me because I like the variability of the job. I would say the hardest thing for me is I work in HPV surgery. So pancreas, liver, bile duct, a lot of these patients are really sick when they come to us and just seeing them come through our doors and knowing it, their life is not gonna last much longer. That's probably the hardest part for me. Sherry, can you tell us a little bit about how many studies you're usually working on and your schedule? and the challenges of your position? Um, I would say my biggest challenge is all of the technology platforms that I have to keep up with. Um, at Duke, we have lots of platforms, so I learned those, but then each study has their electronic data capture and their lab platform, et cetera. They're just a lot. So it, Keeping up with all those passwords has been a challenge for me, but I'm doing it. Um, and yes, basically my week is a 40 hour week, but like um, KP said, some week, sometimes I am working on the weekend, but my boss is also very flexible and says, yes, take time off when you need it. Um, and, and I feel like basically I work eight to five, but if I need to go to an appointment, there is flexibility. It's not like 
when I was in a hospital setting, I was punching a time clock seven to seven. Um, so that is very nice. And there are some options to work from home from time to time when there I don't have subjects to see. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you, Kendra. About how many studies and how's your work week and tell me about your challenges. So I think I have around five studies right now, but we're opening up three or four more. I'm sorry, it's been a mess and this happens sometimes. You'll notice that, that you'll get a flood um, and then you're just trying to stay afloat and figure things out and then it kind of smooths out. So you have this up and down roller coaster, but um, the 40 hour week is pretty standard for us. It ebb and flows. Um, before COVID, we used to do events for some of our studies. So we would actually have open events and have these large amounts of a recruitment. So those would be a full Saturday. And then again, like my uh, managers would let us have a day off during the week. So they kind of balance that out. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> challenges, yes. Challenges, So yes. uh, biggest challenges I would say um, would be trying to I work with a lot of pediatrics and it's very hard to have them follow the constraints of the study. Um, mm -hmm. I give them, I have a Google number, I give them my phone number so that we can try to stay in touch. So if there's any issues, we can work around that. And a lot of the patients have been great, but every once in a while you have patients that have a lot of things going on in their life. And it's just really hard to fit those visit windows or all the uh, procedures and the requirements that are needed for the study. And it, it can be difficult at times. Okay, thank you. Next question. I wanna talk a little bit about opportunities for growth in your position. Um, so KP, why don't we start with you? Okay, so at Atrium, they're pretty generous with the promotions that you get. You typically get a promotion or pay raise every year, depending on how much um, money allocation goes to your department. But if you wanna have a new job position where you might have a higher salary range, I would definitely recommend either doing a research manager role um, on either the more clinical aspect or more of the business research manager role. Those are the two main avenues here at Atrium. Also, if you transferred within departments, sometimes that includes more responsibilities. So it really depends on the department and where you're looking to go next. And when you say clinical track, do you, is that someone who is a licensed clinician? Or can you tell us the difference between those two tracks? So research manager, um, more so at the atrium site, is going to be someone that's overseeing research coordinators, making sure that they're doing what they need to do while also assisting where they need to be. Okay, perfect. Catherine, can you tell us about opportunities for growth? Sure. I would say this is the thing I love the most about this field. Um, I can't speak for the other ladies, but sometimes it is a little bit difficult to see that clear path of how you're going to progress in your career. However, the cool thing about that is, is you get to make it for yourself. So if you start in research coordination and you find out, I love regulatory, I love the rules, I love the regulations, you can kind of go into more of a regulatory type role. Um, there's even doctorates and master's degrees in regulatory science. Um, if you love data, you know, the specific specificities of it, building databases. There's degrees, of course, in statistics or higher level data manager positions. Um, I'm personally in the UNC Wilmington Clinical um, Research and Product Development Master's Program right now, and I absolutely love it. Um, like KP was saying, if you love, you know, kind of that more clinical aspect, you could become more of a program manager that oversees other coordinators in doing their day to day, or you can become a research project manager and do more startup type roles, um, get these grant funded studies off the ground and things like that that. So really, it's what you make it and what you can be passionate about. Terrific. Yeah. And I just want to mention in case anyone has questions. So I went back and I actually got my training in regulatory science. So I have a master's and doctorate in that if you have questions about that path. So Sherry, tell us about your opportunities for growth. Um, I'll say I am just now learning about the opportunities and growth since I've only been in this position for a year, but just after a year, we do have a tier advancement program for um, our CRCs, our clinical research nurse coordinators, and other folks who work in research at Duke. Um, they've got this clear path that you do check off all these boxes and get recommendation letters, which I'm going to be doing this summer, and hopefully get the that promotion. 
that would be in addition to, you know, the standard of living um, promotion that they're going to give to everyone. And then what I also see as a great opportunity for um, the folks in the audience is it's just not at the clinical side, but you get this experience and you may want to go to the industry side. And my understanding is they do very well. <laughs> I enjoy the clinical setting and, and having my patients. So I don't foresee me doing that, but I think there is so much opportunity in this field. Hey, Kendra, please tell us about your opportunities for career growth. So um, I actually started with basically no experience in clinical research, and I started as a clinical specialist, clinical research specialist. So that's right underneath the coordinator and worked my way up to a coordinator. And there's different tiers, tiers as Sherry said, coordinator one, coordinator two, and then you can go to supervisor, team lead, management. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do. You can specialize in different things as well. Nurse coordinator, coordinator. Um, Right now, I'm actually pursuing my MBA with UNC Pembroke with a concentration in health administration. So I would like to climb up the, the ladder of the clinical research field as well. And that's what I'm working toward. And so Kendra, is your, um, do you have tuition benefit as part of your position? Yes, so WakeMed does offer us a tuition reimbursement and I believe Duke does as well. A lot of companies actually industry and non-industry um, offer some kind of tuition reimbursement or um, professional development opportunities. Okay, we see KP is given a thumbs up and Catherine, same for you, tuition benefit at UNC. Okay, terrific. Um, so what are two, the two or three things that you really, really enjoy about being a coordinator? If you could kind of sum it all up, maybe tell us, you know, is there a patient story that stands out, a particular study that stands out that you're willing to share with the audience? So let's start with Sherry. Okay. Um, first of all, I think I the last question, I forgot to tell you how many studies. I'm on about five studies at the time, at this time. Um, the thing that I love most is my subject patient interactions. Um, I have gotten to know, I've been on a basal cell carcinoma study, a topical gel for the past nine months, and I've had six participants. And I feel like we are big buddies because I see them every month they come in. And I just, that has been very enjoyable um, and rewarding to me. Um, that's probably been the best thing about this job is just getting to know my patients. Kendra? I'm going to mirror what Sherry said a little bit. Um, that patient interaction, there's nothing that can replace that. And because I work with pediatrics, I get the entire family. I get the patient and I get the parents as well. And I work pediatrics and adults. So sometimes my studies kind of merge into that adult sector as well. So I might have a patient that is a, uh, a child, but then their parent is also eligible to be in our study. So we kind of have this team. Um, and that is something that's so great to be able to provide some kind of improvement in their health or an outlook on life. You just can't replace that. And I learn every day, every single day, I learn so much. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine. Yeah, I would echo what the other ladies have said. Um, in addition, I part of my job is also a personnel development and training specialist. So I have a very, um, you know, I, my one of my main goals is to just take care of coordinators and to get more coordinators into the field, help them learn to love it, um, help them stay here and help watch them grow professionally. And in the same ways that Sherry and Kendra have said that they um, love to interact with their patients, I also love to interact with other clinical research professionals and just watch them grow and develop their careers into these great things um, over the years, so. KP? I'm pretty much gonna echo exactly what the other woman okay. said. I love being able to interact with the patients. Um, like I mentioned earlier, HPV is a very high mortality rate of specialty. Mm -hmm. One of our study, a lot of our studies, I can't go into specifics on a lot of them, but they involve a Whipple procedure, mm -hmm. which is the removal of part of the pancreas, part of the intestine, part of the gallbladder in the bile duct. 
which sounds invasive and it is invasive. So honestly, being that support person for some of those patients who are about to experience this procedure or just went through it has been a great reward of this position. I can, I can say that as when I was a coordinator, I did lots and lots of different studies. And we used to joke at the end of the study and say, you know, I hope I never see you again. Meaning that you're doing so well, we've cured you and we'll never see each other again in a good way. So yeah, I think it's important for the, those of you in the audience to really kind of reflect when you're thinking about what your path might be and really kind of think about whether this patient interaction is something that you might enjoy or whether you think you might prefer to be more on the industry, the sponsor side. So that is gonna be my last question for our panelists before we turn it over to Laura and the audience's questions is, did you or do you ever consider going to industry? And just tell us a little bit about your thought process, either yes or no, never, maybe. Um, so KP, can you tell us? Yeah, so I definitely thought about going into industry, still might at some point in my life, but right now where I'm at my life, I like being stationary in one location because a lot of the industry sponsor jobs that I saw was a lot of like 50% travel, which I thought was a lot. Um, I have to, about five to 10% travel in my current role. And I think that is a beautiful mix, especially for where I am in my life. And I like having roots in one place for now. And when you Same, travel KP, what kind of um, travel do is a it? Of, it's a lot of fellows courses that we help coordinate for the HPB fellows across the country. So they rolled a Miami trip and a Las Vegas trip. Okay. Sherry, can you tell us any thoughts about industry? Um, at this point, I love where I am, but in three or four years, will I consider it? Yes, I, I may look at industry, but right now I feel like I have, I, I've learned a lot this first year and I love that. That is the best thing about this job is continually learning and not having to pay tuition to, for this knowledge. Um, but yeah, I may consider it. Okay, Kendra. Um, I'm not sure. It's hard to say because the future is unbeknownst to us, but um, I am so happy with where I am now. I really don't think I could find a better team than what I have. So it would have to be a darn good deal to make me leave. <laughs> Catherine, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I actually heavily considered it before I came to the research coordination and management unit. One of my CRAs actually for a study was like, hey, I'll get you into PPD if you want to come be a monitor or CRA. And I was like, whoa, that sounds fancy. But after thinking about it for a little while, you know, they travel all the time. And as much as I like to travel, that much is a little bit like, eh. Um, I can't necessarily speak for industry, but I have heard that their work weeks are a little bit heavier, um, more like 50, 60 hour weeks, some weeks, and a little less work-life balance. And finally, um, being at a site level, I, you really get that um, diversity of tasks. You're not doing the same thing every single day. You're not just doing paperwork. You're seeing patients. You're doing IRB applications. You're doing budgets and contracts sometimes. So I just really love the diversity of being a coordinator. Thank you. So Laura, are you ready for your yes. question? Thank you so much to all of our attendees for all of the great questions in the Q&A box. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. So to, to start off, I think that everyone is already inspired by what you all have shared and they want to better understand how do you, how do you start in clinical research? So I guess we'll start first with educational background based on yourselves, who, what you see with your colleagues. Do CRC positions require a bachelor's degree or do some CRCs have associate's degrees or other credentials? So maybe Susan, can you start and then just give us a, a thumbs up if you agree. Um, and then if, if they don't see all thumbs up, I'll, I'll ask a, for an additional opinion as well. Yeah, so Catherine, since you're in that hiring position, why don't you talk a little bit about what you're seeing? Um, I know we certainly are open. The investigators that I work with are definitely open to people with all sorts of different backgrounds. It really depends on the type of study. So Catherine, do you wanna add? 
Sure. Yeah. So as a caveat, I work at UNC Chapel Hill. So we are inside the North Carolina state system. So we're state employees here. So we have a little bit different um, hiring requirements. However, the majority of people that I see come into our positions do have bachelor's degrees. However, associate's degrees positions are also allowed in these um, types of positions. And I will never not look at somebody just because they don't have a bachelor's degree. Um, especially, I know we have a great program at Durham Tech for clinical research and that associate program and that's amazing so and so Kendra Sherry and KP can you give us a thumbs up if bachelors or associates yep terrific wonderful thanks and I think another thing folks are interested in is about career advancement and I think you all shared your own plans are advanced degrees required for career growth or is just experience in in clinical research enough Catherine, maybe your KP, I should say, can you get us started on this one? Yes, of course. So technically for the position that I hold, they wanted someone with an advanced degree with a master's degree, but I had the experience to back it up. So sometimes it just depends on the position. If they want the experience and they think that's more valuable or if they think the formal education setting is more valuable. I will say I am personally going to pursue a master's eventually just because that's part of my goals and where I want to go later on. But I think I can definitely make all everything that I'm doing now and anything else that I wanted to do in the future happen without having the master's degree. I see a lot of nods. Any any additions? I know Kendra, you are pursuing an advanced degree right now. Any other thoughts about whether or not advanced degrees are required for advancement or maybe just a plus? I think they're just a plus. Um, I think it depends. And a lot of times, like Sherry, she has clinical experience. That can be something that's really needed if you need to have an RN as well, or the just the experience in research. It kind of, they're usually really flexible and they'll state on the job position, whether it's preferred or if they would like a master's degree or experience such as four years experience, they usually specify in the job description. And I think the one thing that I've observed is, you know, sometimes when you get an advanced degree, then the assumption is that you want to move away from patient care because you're typically put in more of these administrative roles like you might be managing a research program and a group of coordinators and then you're stepping back from the day-to-day -day patient interactions and managing your own studies so it's a little bit you know that's sort of what i've observed i know um in the UNC system, that seems to be, you know, as people get advanced degrees, they take on more administrative roles. And, you know, that may or may not be where you see yourself going. Um, and so I know, I mean, I can say that I, that the one thing that I do miss is actually the patient interaction, right? Um, so. Thank you for that, that perspective. There's nothing else to add on that one. Our next question is around, is, is the CRC role a good position for new graduates or people that are new to clinical research? And if not, what would you recommend as a good first role in clinical research? Sherry, I guess, do you wanna maybe start since you, you just recently transitioned into clinical research? Um, yeah, why don't you sure. give us your perspective? I, I do think a new grad could do the position because there's training um, opportunities. And I mean, I, I wouldn't want to be a new grad who is going to be working by myself. But if you're going on to a team, you know, there's lots of training opportunities. And you I suggest getting a mentor um, as well. But I, I do feel that someone who's newly graduated could really learn the position. It, I think it's scary at first because there's so much to learn, but if you enjoy the challenge, um, I, I would do it. Kendra, what are your thoughts on this? So uh, since I started off as a research specialist, but I had a little bit of laboratory experience and a lot of clinical experience, it's a little different, but I would say internships are huge because like with Wake Med, we'll run our internship and a lot of our, page, our uh, interns, sometimes if they want to actually go ahead and apply, we can kind of transition them into the position itself. 
So definitely talking to people, you know, within the, the organization that you're looking for, or even just a, a coworker or a friend and see if you can kind of get your foot in the door, do a shadowing opportunity internship. If you have zero in uh, zero experience whatsoever, but you should never be afraid of clinical research. We'll take anyone and we will train you for sure. KP, did you have something to add? Oh, under yeah, you. sorry. I've only been in this position for four months. Um, I graduated back in 2019. So I'm fairly fresh to all of this. So I can, I think I give a good perspective on it. I initially just wanted to get into the system. Getting into the system was the hardest part for, in my opinion. So I took the first job that I could get and it was a clinical associate position, which was awesome. But knowing that I wanted to advance into this, I took the position because I was like, this will get my foot in the door and it'll allow me to make the connections to get the career that I want at the end of the day. So I think you can definitely do this right out of the college, but I think it's a lot easier if you have that stepping stone first. So another thing I would mention for the audience is remember that clinical research includes a lot of different types of work. OK, so if you find yourself bumping up to a, this barrier where the jobs you're applying for, maybe you're not getting any interest, you may want to think about, well, you know, is it a heavily clinical job like what KP was describing? She has to be in the OR because she's collecting samples. If you have no patient experience, they would probably be worried that you would faint in the OR. OK, so that may not be the best job to start with. OK, there are certainly other types of clinical research that are not drug studies, not clinical trials, more behavioral interventions, um, work done out in the community with other types of interventions. So you may want to just expand your search and maybe look for some of those other types of research where, you know, it's not going to be a huge um, issue that you don't have clinical experience right from the beginning. Catherine, is there anything that you'd like to add to this? Sure, yeah. Um, I would say I was a fresh grad. I had absolutely no experience in anything, to be honest, except working at the ice cream shop when I got my first uh, research position. So you can do it. Again, it's just really reflecting on your past experiences and making yourself look great to the person on the other end of that hiring portal. Um, I'll say too that my first experience was in more social behavioral research. However, I was um, given a job in the clinical research setting was I, when I was in an endoscopy unit multiple times a week. And so they gave me that job and I had absolutely no idea um, what it was like to be in a unit to see someone under sedation, things like that. Um, and it, it worked out pretty okay. So um, the other thing that I would like to say just to add is, as you all probably heard, there are about 50 million different titles that we have in clinical research. You hear re study coordinator, research assistant, research specialist, things like that. So I would encourage you all when you're looking for positions to not only look at the title, but really do look at the description because you might think, oh, I'm not qualified for a research specialist position, but you might be. Same thing with a coordinator or an assistant. Thank you for that. Kendra, there actually is a specific question about the internship that you, that you mentioned at WakeMed. How long does that internship typically last? Typically six months to a year. It depends. Great. Thank you. So throughout all of your comments today, there are a couple of kind of I don't want to say jargony pieces, but jargon for folks that aren't in this world. For individuals that are inspired today, want to, to learn more about IRBs and electronic medical records, are there classes or online resources or ways that you would recommend that they can learn a bit about some of this common lingo in clinical research that could help them to prepare for an interview? Um, Catherine, why don't we start with you? I see you nodding. Sure, yeah. So there's lots of places where you can go. We actually have two professional societies in the clinical research field. One is called SOCRA and one is called ACRP. And both of those um, societies have free and public resources available if you want to learn a little bit more about what it's like, you know, again, those jargony things. Also, um, there is a website called clinicaltrials.gov. Um, it is a public facing website where we are all required to post both information and results from clinical trials in the United States. 
States. And so while this doesn't necessarily give you definitions or explain things, you can kind of see what these protocols are like. We're required to upload protocols and informed consent forms at the end of our trials. So you can actually go in and take a look at those and just get yourself used to the jargon there. Sherry, what are your thoughts? Do you have anything to, to add to that? Well, I would also go to some of the teaching hospital websites, go to Duke, UNC, and look at the clinical research web pages. There's a wealth of information there. They're public facing. KP, were there any resources that you leveraged when you were a student and just considering this as a, an industry to get into? Yes, so I specifically picked um, fellowships and internships for credit that I could take so I could dive in. And that's actually how I got my job. I found a connection and I already knew how to navigate the electronic medical record and our data um, storage, which is called REDCap. So that really helps with me with my interview process. Also going into interviews, going on to clinicaltrials.org, look at the studies that have already been completed at your, that institution where you're interviewing. And that's also a really good segue into introducing yourself saying, hey, I read the study. I thought it was really interested and that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Kendra, do you, do you have anything to add? I would say if you are still not quite finished with your degree and you need one extracurricular class, medical terminology classes are great and they will give you that basic and Latin. <laughs> Latin will tell you everything. So there's one more um, resource that maybe we can put in the chat box too. Um, the NIH actually has a completely online for free certificate in clinical research. It's called Introduction to Principles and Practice of Clinical Research. And if you register for the class, then you can actually sit for an exam. And as long as you pass it, I think you need maybe a 70 or something on it. Um, you can take it anytime you want. So you can go through the lectures, you know, binge do them or pace them out. But if you pass the exam, you actually get a certificate from the NIH that you've passed the course. You can access individual lectures without registering if you just want a single lecture that covers kind of terminology. But um, if you want the certificate, it's free and they've been doing it for a while. So it's a great other resource. I heard professional societies, online resources, things that are free, that is all wonderful. Thinking about once you've utilized and leveraged all those tips that you guys just provided, do you have any other recommendations on how to make your resume more competitive once you're actually taking that next step to apply? Catherine, since you are doing some, do some reviewing as part of your role, can you maybe kick us off on this question? Of course. Um, so resumes, as we all kind of know, they can be a little bit tough, right? You have basically one page, to throw it all out there and show the hiring committee why you're special. So again, like I said at the very beginning, think about your past experiences. Think about things even like volunteer positions that you've had, things that you've done and what you've learned from those. I really encourage people to make a table um, outside of their CV and their resume to write down what was this experience and what did I learn from it? And then see if you can synthesize that information into a bullet point on your resume. Usually, um, at least at UNC anyway, we also require a cover letter. Um, so use that cover letter to cover things that you couldn't in your resume. So things that you didn't have have enough time to do and you use that to really show why you're passionate and something I think it was KP that said that really puts people apart in my eyes when you get to the interview stage is doing your research about the research group itself what studies they're doing who are the PIs um, and just try to see what you can find out and if you express that interest I bet that will give you a leg up on other candidates. Sherry what are your thoughts having fairly recently submitted an application that clearly went well? Well, what I did, because it had been quite a while that I had done a resume. So I did my resume and I met with a friend who used to work in human resources and asked her to critique my resume, help me make it sound better because that I, I do have great communication skills, but selling myself on a piece of paper that was a little tough, <laughs> but she did help me to highlight, like Catherine said, 
everything I'd done to sell myself. So getting input from others can be very beneficial. That's great. Kendra, what are, what are your thoughts based on your experience and what you've seen maybe from other colleagues coming in at Wake? So I would definitely say find what you're good at and then find the examples that express that. So sometimes you can say, oh, I'm detail oriented, but how do you show that you have been successfully detail oriented? And that would be my one suggestion is make sure you're showing based on experience or clubs or anything you've done that can show those skills. Absolutely. KP, anything to add to, to close out these recommendations? Um, I mirror everything that everyone has already said and add on top of that, in your resume, you have a page. You need to pour your heart and soul into it and tell the employer why. Oh, KP, we're losing you a little bit. Wow. Hopefully we'll we can back. Circle, circle back to, to KP because I think that she's right. You do have that one page that you want to make the most out of. But while we are waiting for her to hopefully unfreeze on us, another thing that has come up already, but I think would be great to spend a little bit more time on is internships, volunteer opportunities. These, I think we all understand are really valuable, but how do you go about actually finding a volunteer or internship opportunity? Um, me, Kendra, could, could you share a little bit since you have already mentioned the, the experience at WakeMed? Sure. Most um, hospital environments will have some kind of volunteer internship program. And I will say that even though COVID has been an obstacle, most of our universities and hospitals are welcoming volunteers at this time and interns. So you can really just do a Google search like Raleigh, North Carolina Clinical Research Internship. And I bet you, you'll find a bunch of opportunities. Google is an amazing thing. Catherine, what, what do you see in terms of accessing internships and volunteer opportunities? Sure, so um, I do know that ACRP also has a great landing page where they post internships and volunteer opportunities from across the nation. So I definitely would point you all in that direction as well, in addition to what Kendra said. Sherry, do you have anything to add? I would say if you're still in college, I would, um, and, and if you're at a teaching hospital, contact the clinical research unit, like at Docker, which is Duke Office of Clinical Research. We really, we use our nursing students, med students, grad students, undergrad students, and there are so many opportunities and, and we really value their help. So talk to someone and or your professor, you know, lots of times your professors know how to help you get opportunities as well. KP, are you back with us? Huh? Yes, hi. I am sorry, my computer decided to crush on me. So I'm on my phone now. I think we have all experienced these technical <laughs> difficulties over the last year and we all have empathy for one another. Uh, we, well, first of all, I would love to, to hear your, your closing comment on how to make resumes as competitive as possible. We heard you talking about that passion and pointed out on the page, but would love to hear the rest of your thought. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, I would definitely recommend making your resume as detailed as possible, putting in like how many, if you've ever worked in research before, say a specific trigger word, like I've worked in clinical research before, I was patient facing, put those types of words in your resume and just make sure that your cover letter doesn't reiterate what your resume says. You need to say something special in there connected to why you want this position and just don't be as redundant as I have been in the past, apparently. Um, one other thing I, I might add to that um, is, you know, there's always, and this has been a persistent problem in clinical research for decades, is this, you know, challenge of subject recruitment and also diversifying our subjects who we recruit into um, clinical research. So, you know, another thing you can think about is in your past experience, if you have any experience, you know, working with community organizations or, you know, volunteering with different groups, um, all of those kinds of interactions and your knowledge about the community can also actually be an incredible asset. Again, it really depends on the kind of study 
Um, you can be actually a tremendous asset to a research team by having some insight into, you know, the, the perceptions and the attitudes about research. So, you know, another tip might be if you have a, a, an opportunity to, to volunteer, even that experience, I think you can amplify on your CV. Absolutely. And on, on the note of volunteering, the other thing that we were talking about KP was how to find those internship and volunteer opportunities. If you could share a little bit more about your own experience with that and then any tips for folks that may be interested in working with the team at Atrium in that capacity. Definitely, just um, the biggest thing I would say is don't be afraid to reach out to people. People are like other people. They wanna help you out if they can. So how I got my internships in the past was just reaching out to advisors that I had while I was in school. I actually worked for my sister's ex-boyfriend at one point because he was in the field and he was a connection that I could use. So just don't overlook any connections that you might have. You don't know, like if you're a nanny, the father could be in a, a surgeon and know someone that's looking for an intern or something like that. Just don't be afraid to put your foot out in the door and try and make that connection if you can. So I have a, a question that relates to this concept of interviewing and finding your role. So um, would you recommend to the audience, you know, if they're not sure if they want to be a CRC or a CRA or whatever their role is going to be, would you recommend they kind of leave that out of the interview for their CRC position? You know, when they're asked about what their goals are? Um, and the reason I raise this is because, you know, I know there's a little bit of sensitivity to, you know, high turnover, right? Um, and is this job going to be a pass through on the way to something else? And so I'm just curious what all of your experiences have been, you know, is that something that's okay to say? Should people maybe pause and, you know, not reveal that just yet? What do you think, Catherine? Sure. So um, I always take the um, lane of just be truthful in your interviews, um, because if you're not, that's going to hurt you. It's also going to hurt the hiring team themselves. Um, everybody understands that, you know, we're all on a path to doing something else, whether that's, you know, staying in clinical research, which I hope you all do, um, or, you know, going to med school, going to PA school, going to wherever you're going. Um, but I will say, especially in coordination, you do want to try to dedicate about a year to two years of being in this field because it takes that long, to be honest, if you don't have any experience to really dive in and start to understand what these things are and you really do need that time to grow so that's what I would say about that. Sherry what do you think? I will echo what Catherine says I would say minimum one year but probably two to three in this position is ideal before you're going to jump to that next level. Um, I also wanted to give the folks an idea of volunteering. I, I thought of something while um, Kendra was talking about internships. If you don't have a lot of time, you may want to volunteer to work at, say, a diabetes camp or an asthma camp. Those are shorter um, opportunities. It may be two, three weeks, a month, and that could make you maybe realize, do I want to work with patients? And you would meet some physicians and um, clinical researchers. So those are also some other opportunities to think about. That's a great addition. Thanks, Sherry. Is there anything else to add on, on this last point? Or are you all ready for the next question from the audience? Ready? So We've talked about this a little bit, but I think it really is important. So I want to get back into it. Talk, we're focused today on CRCs, but I think a lot of folks know that CRAs are another role that you hear a lot about in clinical research. If you could maybe give your, your one, one or two sentence comparison of what a CRC is compared to a CRA, and then a pro and a, pro and a con of being, being a CRC. So Susan, I'll let, I'll let you start because I know that you gave us our, our intro just helps set the, set the stage of where all these folks, folks sit. Well, so I can give my opinion from way back when, when I used to do, do this work. So I, I, you know, my, I, I would always look at the CRAs and I would be like, yeah, 
that's glamorous being on the plane, but boy, that's all you do. And there may be a time in your life that you want to do that. But what, what I, the reason I really gravitated towards staying a CRC is because I felt like I wanted to have more control. I, I felt like the CRAs were just kind of hoping we would recruit patients and hoping we would give good data. And, you know, a lot of their job was to be like cheerleading us and, you know, but there was very little they could do, you know, other than bug us about recruiting and quality data. So I really like to have more of a frontline kind of position and be able to really influence the research. And um, so that was kind of my take on CRAs, CRCs. And, you know, these analysts have really reiterated, the, you know, the incredible powerful nature of patient interactions. You know, there's just something so rewarding about these volunteers really, you know, getting to know you and having that relationship. Um, so Kendra, do you want to speak to your CRA, CRC-ness? Sure. So I would say as a CRC, you're kind of the middle person of between the patient and the sponsor. And the CRA is your link to the sponsor. So as a CRC, we're running the study, we're kind of getting everything done that the sponsor expects us to do. And the CRA is really good because they're really great for guiding us through difficult parts or if we're having an issue with a procedure or if we need to change something or add a new site or location or something like that. That's when they're really there for us um, and just kind of guiding us and making sure we're doing everything we're supposed to be doing. So I don't want to put a CRA down because I really need them to help do my job. But yes, they do also um, travel a lot. And as a CRC, most of the time you get to travel as um, KP, and I think Catherine also said that, actually you probably all probably said this, that we travel a little bit. When I first started this job, I got the um, opportunity to go to Amsterdam and it was very quick after I started and I was so excited. And then I went to Baltimore and Indiana. It was like, three months, I was traveling all over the place. And I thought, oh my God, what did I get myself into? <laughs> but it kind of seems like it's again, that ebb and flow. You have these bouts of traveling and then you're home for a long time. But CRA Kendra, tell well. the group why you were traveling. Cause I think that's important for them to know why you would travel in your role. Right. So when you start a study, you have to go to what is called uh, an investigator, um, and they, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting what it's called now. Investi Investigator meeting. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's a big meeting and it brings um, a little bit of people, a little bit of each site all together so we can meet each other and we all get trained on the study and kind of where the sponsor's coming from. And a lot of times you'll bring like your physician with you. So it's a nice bonding experience, especially when I went to Amsterdam, the physician I had had never worked on a um, sponsor led study before. So it was new to her. So it was great that we got to bond there and kind of learn about this research together. And then you get to, usually you're there and you go to all these different meetings, all these trainings, and then they usually give you a day or so and you can kind of explore or kind of fit the exploration into your meeting. So it's really great. Sherry, that's what's your all the upside of travel? Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Sherry, what are, yeah, Sherry, what are your pros that drew you to clinical research coordination? Well, I love coordination um, as I guess we're all in that role that what I see from the CRA perspective I do look to them for guidance um, and I appreciate them looking at my work um, I'm not quite sure I could do that I was an accountant before I was a nurse and it reminds me of auditing <laughs> so I'm just not sure I could do that but they are very valuable to the study and unfortunately I came right before COVID I have not gotten to travel to those site meetings um, Kendra I'm jealous Catherine, what, what drew you, what are the pros of being a CRC that drew, drew you to that career path? Yeah, so I will say the way that I think about the difference between a CRC and a CRA is that a CRC is um, recording the data. You're on the ground, you're getting the data from the patients, from the providers, wherever you need it. The CRA is there to check your data. 
and to make sure that you're getting it from the right sources, make sure that you're doing everything correctly and following regulations. So I'll say I have a very unique experience because like I said earlier, I actually act as a CRA type position internally at UNC. And so I actually prefer the coordination because for me, the CRA type job, it's very tiring to me um, because for my monitoring visits, I go for two full business days and you sit in a cube um, at the office and you just look through patient files and I compare them to our electronic medical record. And some people, that's where they thrive and that's great. But for me, it is so detail oriented that I'm just so tired at the end of the day that it's just not 100% my style. I don't know if I could do it full time. So. I think that personal reflection and knowing what, what fits you best is really critical. KP, do you have any other, other thoughts that, about what drew you to the CRC position? Definitely. Um, we all hi highlighted this earlier that we love being involved with the patients and seeing them on a face-to-face -face basis and having a first name relationship with them. I just feel like I didn't, wasn't gonna get that from the CRA position. And so that's why I chose the CRC and especially because you do get the best of both worlds. You are still reporting that data, making sure that it's accurate and factual, but you're also having the patient interactions. You're able to travel on a lesser scale. You still get to know the PIs and all the other people within your department, which I really appreciate. I agree. I think that people piece is, is so fun and good to know that that's an important piece of this role. Another question that's a little bit more technical, um, what challenges do you face during subject recruitment? Do you find that people are usually willing and interested to enroll in, in studies, or do you find that you're really having to educate pr prospective subjects into the value and, and why they should consider participating? So maybe Kendra, do you mind starting this one? Of course. Yeah. So when I used to work in non-pediatric studies, it seemed a lot easier to recruit patients because they kind of understood. But now with pediatrics, I have to first convince, not convince, we don't convince anyone. Um, but I have to explain what the reasoning is. And you're actually trying to get this, this parent to agree for their child to go into research studies. So once I have the parent on board and they are definitely willing to do it. Now I have to turn my attention and talk to the child in a lot, a lot less um, technical term, which, in, and, and it's so hard to do that, to switch back and forth. Um, and a lot of times you can just see the kids saying, well, whatever mom and dad say, which is good, but you want them to understand what they're getting themselves involved in. And that's an important point also for the audience. Um, it, you know, communication is so huge. Um, and you can imagine right from the beginning through an informed consent process, you're often the one interfacing. So if you feel like you've had problems with communication or maybe you've been told that or um, trying to think of ways to improve those communication skills, written as well as verbal, because again, this is a highly regulated environment. You really can't riff on a consent form. You really have to kind of stick to the, the structure. So that could be an area where, you know, you can think about improving that. Absolutely. So Kendra, you shared about some of the challenges of working with children. KP, you've talked about working with patients that are often terminally ill. What's, what's your take on enrollment and the challenges there? Um, so the biggest challenge is kind of thinking of it like Grey's Anatomy. They come to us thinking that we have the end all cure all and me, my biggest role is telling them, we don't know if this is gonna help you. We know it's probably not gonna hurt you. Otherwise we cannot offer this to you. But I just want you to be aware that this may or may not help you. And then you also have to explain that to their family members. Cause a lot of times, especially with pancreatic cancer, you don't know that you have it until it's too late. So normally you're still meeting families during that grieving process where they're trying to absorb the information that they just got. So you want to explain it to everyone that's in the room with them, because more often than not, it's not going to be just the patient you're consenting. Although that's the only signature you need on the piece of paper, they're going to listen to their family members. They're going to listen to the internet and what they're able to research. So the way that I've best found consenting patients is telling it like a story. Why are we looking at this research? Well, because there's this problem and it just happens that you have it. So let me tell you about this study and tell you how it might make you better or how you might advance medical care in the future. I think that's a great way to look at it. 
Catherine or Sherry, do you have anything else to add based on the patients and the, the types of studies you've worked on? Yeah, um, so I really want to echo what KP just said, because that's just very important, is what we call therapeutic misconception in clinical research. So we toe the line between clinical care and research, and it's very important, like Catherine said, to make sure that our subjects understand that this is not their clinical care, and they're doing this. It could benefit them. It could not. And so that's something that's very important to understand as you get into the field. I will say I have done a lot of cold calling when it comes to recruitment. And that is just picking up the phone, dialing somebody's number and hoping they answer and talking to a stranger. And while that can be kind of intimidating, it's actually kind of fun. Um, I kind of enjoy it because I like talking to people, as y'all can probably figure out. Um, but, you know, people are a lot more receptive, I think, than you think they will be when it comes to research. A lot of people want to help. Um, a research study that was done, I think it was back in 2014, that examined people's reasons for participating in research. People were more likely to participate in research because of the benefit to society as opposed to monetary compensation. So when you are recruiting, you can't let kind of those fears of, oh, they're not going to want to do this. You know, I'm going to be super awkward, keep you from, you know, putting your foot out there and making sure that we get people into trials. Sherry, any, any final thoughts on recruitment? I would just echo what all of these folks say. And just like you said, we just have to ask people. And I would say the biggest challenge is getting more diversity in clinical research. And that is a challenge all over the U.S. And I think we're all working really hard to ask more diverse people to participate. So happy that you brought up diversity in clinical trials. I think we could probably spend an entire session talking just about that and why it's so important. So thank you for, for mentioning that, Sherry. As we are nearing the top of the hour, one last question for you all. You are clearly incredibly passionate about the work that you're doing, but if you were not in clinical research coordination, what other role in clinical research would you want to do? And we'll start with Susan. Yikes. You've already made, you've already made the transition, so you could say your current job. Yikes. So I could say my patients. current yeah. job. Um, yeah, well, I tell you, I, I have a huge passion for research. I feel very strongly about clinical research. And um, so what I am working on now, which is where I want to stay, is, is really trying to address this piece of better enrollment in clinical trials, more creative ways to do clinical trials. I've done some work in terms of using social media to collect data. How can we do that well and things like that. So um, I am a clinical research trial kind of person for life. Um, love it, I love it. Kendra, I feel like maybe we have an idea since you told us about what you're training towards, but, but it doesn't have to be that credentials, not, notwithstanding, what would be the next best thing other than what you're already doing? So before I got on my clinical research path, I wanted to be a nurse. So I'd probably be, able to be a nurse coordinator. That's awesome. Sherry, let's, let's transition to you since you are a nurse and a coordinator. I'm not sure I could changed anything at this point. I really love what I'm doing. Um, I would say the first few weeks, I was a little nervous. Is this right for me? But once I got over that hump and met with some mentors and had lots of support, I'm like, I am very passionate about this. And I, this, I will end my career in research. That is, I feel like what, what everyone, every employer, I think, hopes to hear the people they work with say, Catherine, what, what's, what's the next best thing for you? Yeah, I kind of echoing what Susan said, I feel like I'm already in it because I coordinate, but I'm also this personnel development and training specialist. So really educating and training clinical research coordinators and other clinical research professionals to be the best they can be. It's my dream job and I absolutely love it. I would say if you want me to think of something else, I would probably say regulatory associate would be the next thing for me because I love the rules and regulations. KP, finally, what, what is your other position that would be amazing if you weren't a coordinator? So I love my position. The only thing I would change is my department eventually. Um, this 
job probably does not exist, but I would love to do doula and midwifery research. I think that would be mm -hmm. so cool and fascinating just to bring the awareness more around. I know more people are hiring doulas and midwives to be a part of their birth process, but I think learning best practices and seeing what different techniques can be used to be really interesting, honestly cool to figure out. Thank you. A huge thank you to our moderator, our panelists, and all of you for joining us tonight. I am going to share a bit more information with you all to close us out. If you are interested in more information about CRCs, other careers in clinical research, and North Carolina CROs, visit ncbiotech.org slash CRO. And please keep an eye on your email and NC Biotech's events calendar to register for our next conversation. And we hope to see you all then. Have a wonderful night. And thank you so much for joining us.